going to read Matthew 5, 21 through 48. Matthew 5, 21 through 48. So get ready. Here we go. It says this. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your, your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You, who, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, and for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may, have, you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is a lot. That is a lot, but there's so much to unpack here, right? So first, we're going to start with the law. We talked about the law. We talked about what the law is. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to talk about grace. And I want you to understand the there's the requirements of the law, and then there's the requirements of grace. We have this understanding that it's impossible to follow the law, which is true. But we say, oh, grace is everybody's under grace. However, what if I tell you, the stipulation and the requirements of grace are harder than the stipulations and the requirements of this impossible law. But we'll get to that. So what we have here is Jesus is teaching. Jesus is reteaching. He's reteaching the law to the people. Why? 
because they were taught it wrong. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin was teaching the law wrong. Now, were they doing this on purpose? Was it because it, it just broke down in translation throughout time? Was it a heart issue? It can be all three. All I know is they were teaching it wrong. Here's the issue. Wrong teaching leads to wrong understanding. Wrong understanding leads to wrong living. If you have the doctrine wrong, you have everything wrong. And that's why it is very important that we have our doctrine right. Yes. And Jesus is telling the people something. This is life changing. Jesus is saying you have heard, yeah. meaning they weren't reading their Bibles. Exactly. You have heard. Jesus is saying, no, you need to read. Yes. So in 2020, I say it. Tiana says it all the time. We're going to say it to you again. Read your Bible. Yeah. Because what you have heard might not be what God means. Exactly. And I just want to tag in on there on that part. Um, and one of the main important reasons for this is navigation. That's is good. Is navigation. If we ourselves are not going through our Bibles, reading through, through these ex and instructions that are given in the Bible, how do we know how to get through certain things? Mm -hmm. Because then at that time, who is the only one who knows how to get through certain things? The, the priest or the Sadducee or the Pharisee. Because why? They were the ones that were reading the Bible. And so if you can think of it in this way, we had a middle man who was the gatekeeper, quote unquote, because it wasn't official, to the navigational tool of the Bible. And so Jesus is coming here saying, you have heard it. And he has come to not abolish it, but he wants us to, to go deeper into the law and have an even higher standard. So if we go higher than just hearing it, that means now we have to do it. Mm -hmm. And so these laws can't just be said through the Pharisees, but also they have to be learned by us. Right. So that is why we're always telling you to read your Bible. Get, through, get your Bible in your hands, fill the papers out, Learn to, to learn which and where each you know chapter is, each book is, so that you know for yourself. Because if you don't know how to navigate these Bibles, you can't expect for somebody else to navigate it for right. you. Right. So now there's this code. We're gonna go through these chapters. We're talking about murder. We're talking about divorce. We're talking about adultery. We're talking about eye for eye. We're talking about an oath. It's it's the same principle, right? So one, Jesus is reteaching. Right? He's reteaching because the people have a wrong teaching. And what is this wrong teaching? The way it was taught in the day, they taught the law as a matter of external performance only. So they taught the law superficially. It was all about works, what you did. Okay? Jesus and God, remember, God always looks to the heart. So this, as we go through this, I want you to remember that. Jesus is reteaching this because the Pharisees taught it as an external thing only. They taught it as works only. All right. So here we go. We're going to start with murder. murder. We're going to start with murder. There's a lot of things we have to unpack here. You have heard mm -hmm. it was said long ago, thou shalt not murder. Mm -hmm. And anyone who subjects to murder is um, so, under judgment. Yeah. So here's the thing with that. Here's the thing. Jesus isn't justifying murder. But what we have to understand is in American language, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, there's two words. There's murder, there's kill. Okay? People thought, hey, that shall not murder meant you shouldn't kill either. However, there's always a distinction. There is always a distinction between murdering and killing. So let's talk about murdering, right? Murdering is you taking someone's life for no reason, for an unjust reason, right? right? Killing. Now, I can't do any of these myself. However, there are just things. There are killings that can be considered just. 
in the eyes of God, maybe not. God doesn't want this. I don't want this. I can't do this. But let's go through it. So there's, there is self-defense. If someone is attacking you to come and take your life or attacking your family or attacking your household and you defend yourself and that person ends up dying, you didn't murder that person. You killed that person in self-defense. Right. And if it can be proven that you killed that person in self-defense, this is known as a justified killing. There's war. Legal war, just war. There are wars that people are legit defending their country, defending their livelihoods. People are attacking them for no reason. And in the act of war, in the act of defending their country, defending their homeland, defending their people and their families, they kill soldiers of the other army. They didn't want to, they had to. So this can be viewed as a justified killing. Right. Once again, it's hard, it sucks. And then the final one is the legal killing. So there are people that have committed crimes, whether you believe in capital punishment or not, that's not what we're talking about here, but we have to understand in the laws of Moses, remember it was a theocracy, meaning God was in control. And under that theocracy, there were a lot of Laws that if you broke, you were to be put to death legally, right. right? Now, how do we say that here? In America, depending on what state you live in, there's something called capital punishment where if you commit an act that is deemable um, that you should be put to death, that happens. Now, it doesn't happen immediately, but so those are the three types of killing that can be viewed as justified. Self-defense, just wars, and a legal, legal death sentence. So when we're talking about thou shalt not murder, we're not talking about that. Right. We are talking about you taking someone's life mm -hmm. for no reason. Definitely. And we're going to move to the next verse. It says this, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Mm. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, underline this, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool, underline this, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So we're going to pause right there. What's happening? So obviously Pastor Chris touched on murder. Murder is the extreme. But Jesus is talking to us as well on how we get there, how we get to murder. So it's not only the act itself, but it's also the heart condition. Jesus is not condemning us being angry righteously. He's condemning our actions that we do out of fleshly anger. And murder is one of those things that happens that is done when we act out of our anger, which is in flesh, which is in response um, to, you know, issues that are going on with others. And so we see here, um, moving forward, there if you are offering your gift to the altar and then remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. So remember we talked about kind of like this unfolding thing of how we get to murder. Murder happens from unreconciliation, if that's a word, can I say unreconciliation? Like not having peace with your brother and sister in Christ. Why are you angry with someone else? Why are you not wanting them to live? What is there that's going on between you and this other person that is having murder on your mind? So here, Jesus is telling you, he's saying this again, he said it before, live in peace with other people. And how do we do that? By stopping all of these things that don't matter until we get right with our brother and sister. So yes, these gifts unto me are important, but I care about you loving on your brother and sister. So before you do anything else, I need you to get right with them. Because if you don't, it will lead to murder. It will lead to something consequential where there not only will be, you know, judgment on that anger, but judgment for that murder that you're committing. Right. 
And so here we see the reteaching. Right. The reteaching. So remember, all of these, Jesus is reteaching because the Pharisees, they were teaching from an outward and external a works point of view. Right. So for the Pharisees, it was as long as you don't murder the person, you're fine. Right. So I can say whatever I want to say about you. Mm. I can assassinate your character. Mm. I can be nasty to you. In my heart, I can hate you. But as long as I don't put my hands on you, I'm fine. Can we pause there? Right. So that word raka, I just want to rewind real quick. That word um, is a term of hatred that means empty-headed fool. And this can lead to calling a person a godless fool, my commentary says, in anger and indicates the person's heart attitude, as I said before, that places one in danger of hell. So if we start off, and we see so many times that it happens in the mind, mm -hmm. then we speak it out, and then we act it out. So Jesus is touching on these different things. He's touching on the mind, how we're thinking about people. Then he touches with that word, raka, how we're speaking out. And then the act of murder, right? So which is one of the things that we're not supposed to be doing. So if you've ever said to somebody something mean out of hatred in order to harm them, what's happening? You're going against the law. Right. You're acting towards murder. And there's a heart check that needs to happen. So... Show of hands in this room, how many of you murdered a person last night? I don't remember if I said right? I did. I did. Like, like, I did murder. This is something that we all can agree with. Right. However, if I say by show of hands, how many of you were angry with someone last night? Right? How many of you said something you didn't mean last night? Right now, the hands start going up, right. but this is the reteaching. Right. Jesus goes to the extreme saying, if you're angry with someone before you even present God with an offering, leave the offering there and go fix it. Right. So what's the application here? Reconcile. Reconcile. So reconcile. We, we've been talking about this a lot this year. Yes, when you hear the word reconcile, that means there was a relationship there. There was. So if you, whether it's your brother, your sister, a friend, someone you cared about, someone that cares about you, when we talk about reconciliation, we're ministers of reconciliation. That's what the scripture says. You are called to the ministry of reconciliation. So if there's anger, what are you to do? Go reconcile. Then there's settling matters. So settle matters... Uh, even if you're not close to someone, yeah. right? If you have something against somebody, settle the matter, right? What, no matter how petty the argument is, no matter how huge the argument is, just go and settle it. Because if you settle it, then there can be no more, recall, um, there, can, there can be no more judgment there. Right. If you settle it already, it can't go further. But if you don't settle it, you might end up be in jail or you might end up, somewhere you don't want to end up. So that's your application for murder, right? Don't murder, of course, but also don't be angry. Right. And if you're angry with someone, right. settle it or reconcile it. Yes, definitely. Right. So we're going to move forward to the adultery section. Um, uh, read with me in verse 27. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Underline that. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, underline the word lustfully, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Underline the first part, lose one part of your body. Verse 30. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body, here it goes again, than for your whole body to go into hell. Okay. So, once again, it's the same principle. Reteach, all right? So, for the Pharisees, as long as you, the way they taught it, as long as you don't physically cheat on your wife. You don't physically kiss someone. You don't physically sleep with someone, right? 
it's fine. However, what Jesus is saying is you have to go deeper. And, and this is something we can learn even before you're married, right? If I look at a woman lustfully, he considers this a heart sin. If I even look at a woman lustfully, I've sinned in my heart and committed adultery. Can we pause there? Go ahead. And so for those who haven't um, like really learned what the word lustful means, lustful is showing or having strong feelings of sexual desire. Okay, so we're not going to go too deep into that. But desire comes from where? That's an internal feeling, right? That's something that starts within us opposed to externally, right? And so what is happening here is Jesus is telling us, again, that we have to look on the inside of ourselves so that we do not act out on these desires that are inside of us. Matter of fact, he's saying, I don't even want you to think this way right. because you're putting yourself into temptation. So just a quick nugget there. Um, what this lustful means, it's, it's um, feelings of desire, specifically sexual, and it's internal, and these are desires that we should not have. So scripture says, take every thought captive. So if you start thinking about something, you have control of your minds, all of you, okay? If you start thinking about something inappropriate, whatever it is, take captive of that thought. Stop yourself. Right. Nope, nope, nope. I'm not going there. Right. And think about something else. Right. Read something else. Focus on what you're supposed to be focusing on. Maybe it's homework. Maybe it's the teacher. Maybe it's the sermon. Maybe it's your parents talking. But refocus yourself. Take captive of every thought. Let me tag in there. Tag. So what Pastor Chris is getting at is, again, self-control. So we talked about these beatitudes. We talked about the characteristics and um, the different traits of a true Christ follower. And one of them is having self-control. And so here, Jesus is is not only condemning the act, the physical act like we talked before, but the unrestrained imagination and uncontrolled desire to act out certain things. So if you do not have control over your mind, over your imagination, over your desires, you've got an issue here. And Jesus is saying you have got to have control not only of your body, but also over your mind. And so I just wanted to touch on that, that the inner desire for ungodly sexual pleasure, if thought upon a great deal and not resisted, it is sin. Right. So once again, the Pharisees were saying, as long as you don't commit the physical act, but Jesus is saying, no, it's far deeper than that. Right. And here's how I'm going to help you, right? Before you're even married or if you're married. So here's some things that you should never do. Like, so as a man, I never have inappropriate conversations with women. That's not my wife, right? It's because I'm not opening the door. We were taught in ministry, um, in, in seminary, to never counsel women alone or with a door closed, right? So I'm never in a room with the opposite sex without the door open, right? I'm never counseling, I'm never out to lunch with the opposite sex if Tiana's not there because I'm protecting myself, exactly. right? Jesus is saying, if you even look lustfully, right? So we protect ourselves. So for you, those of you that are not dating, you know you're not ready to date. Well, that means, I'm not saying you don't have, I'm not saying you can't have friends of the opposite sex. Sure you can. But if you know you're not ready to date right. and you know someone's into you, you don't need to be around them. You don't need to be one-on-one -on -one with them. Some of you have childhood friendships, great. But if it's not a childhood friendship, you have to be very careful that you're not leaning someone on. You may not be interested, but you don't know if they are, okay? If, if you are ready to date and there is someone that you like, I suggest you never go out alone. Group date, go to the movies, go, 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 go bowling, go miniature golf. Don't put yourself in a situation where something can happen. Yeah, and, and really, we, we have to think of it practically, right? So anyone ever go um, bowling? I love bowling. I'm good at bowling, too. I suck. But uh, compared to my dad, like, my dad would beat me all the time. He's a great bowler. But similar to bowling, you ever go bowling with someone for the very first time, and it's their first time, but you're kind of like, you're good at it, and you're like, I don't know. If you don't know how to bowl, you should probably put up the what? 
the guardrails. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because they're gonna get a gutter ball and it's gonna go off the track. So in this same way, in this same way, I gave you this imagery so that you can see for yourself when you are on a path that God has set for you, you are the bowling ball. You've got to go straight. You got to knock it out. You got to get that strike. But in order for you to get there, you've got to put up some guardrails. Mm. You have to put up guardrails because what happens if you get too far to the edge and there's no guardrail, Dale, what's going to happen? You are going to go off of that edge. That edge signifies temptation. That edge signifies that sin that we, we sometimes have too much of a desire for. If we do not put those guardrails up, we are not protecting ourselves. So in the same way, protect yourself from these different types of sin, these different desires that you personally know have possibly an issue with or, or there's no real restraint there. So what you're saying is put up guards to keep your mind out the gutter. Yeah. His wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Here again, we see sexual immorality being an issue. And, and we don't even have to go into the deepness of it because even in today, there's an issue on the value, the actual value of what um, place we should have, we should put sexual things for or in. Anything sexuality should be within a marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Unless it's your personal, you know, thing that you're, you're, you're working through, which is like your gender and so forth. You have to make sure that any type of sexual acts is within a marriage. So we see here that this first, this scripture is talking about marriage, right? And the, the result of when a marriage is like right. having some issues in it, which is like sexual immorality. So, so um, same principle, wrong teaching. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is reteaching, but now we're seeing that this wrong teaching is now starting to affect the life and now it's wrong living, right? So Jesus is saying, um, there is, you've heard that you were to give a certificate of divorce. So what is this coming from? This is actually coming from Deuteronomy 24.1, if you want to read it. Deuteronomy 24.1, and Moses is tired. Most people are complaining. People are getting on his nerves, and they want divorces. And he was like, all right, if you want to get a divorce, just make sure you give her a certificate. Right. And what he meant by that is he wanted you to write down why you wanted a divorce. Right. And in writing, he hoped that you would say, what am I doing? This is foolish, right? right? What am I doing? This doesn't make any sense. And he hoped that it would deter you from getting a divorce. However, the Pharisees took that and they were teaching it wrong. Right. Now, Jesus, Jesus is saying, Moses permitted, you heard you could give a certificate of divorce. Right. However, for, there's only one reason there's only one reason where I will accept a divorce. Now, in Deuteronomy 24, one, it says the word uncleanliness, right? So it's a loose translation. So they use the word uncleanliness for whatever they wanted it to. So they wanted the, you, I gave you a certificate for divorce of uncleanliness. Right. But what does that even mean? Jesus here gives you the definition. The uncleanliness means sexual immorality. Right. So if they cheat on you with another person sexually, not if they don't want to cook for you, not if you, not if you get into arguments, not any of that, not any of the oh, things really. people get divorced for here in America. Right. Or, or here's my favorite, unreconcilable differences. Right? And I'm not judging divorce, but that's not, that's what they tried to make it seem. Right. That's not what Jesus is saying. Matter of fact, if you really go into the Bible, you understand. Malachi 2.6. Malachi 2.6. For I hate divorce, says the Lord. The God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord, of heaven's army. So guard your heart. Guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. Now, 
gender, we can switch to genders because statistically more women file for divorce in America than men. So just switch it. Don't divorce your husband, okay? Don't, and, and, and overwhelm him. Don't cheat on him. Just like it's saying to the men, it's saying it to the women, okay? Both people, don't divorce your spouse and overwhelm them. Guard your hearts. Jesus replied in Matthew 19, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not so, not this way in the beginning. What does it mean? Marriage is so important. You know why? Satan didn't show up until marriage did. Mm. In the beginning, God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son, right? Our holy trinity. They can't divorce each other. They can't walk out on each other. And when God created us, he created us in his image. He right. created male and female. Right. And then when Adam and Eve, when Eve arrived, that's when Satan arrived. You know why? Because marriage is the representation yes. of God on earth. Right. Who, who's the church? We're God's bride. Fellas, us too. We are God's bride. God will return for his bride. We're to be faithful to God like the bride is to be faithful to the husband. Jesus died for us like the husband is to die for his bride. So marriage, marriage is the way we represent God. When you see a great marriage, that is the kingdom of heaven right there. When you see a bad marriage, you're like, ooh, I don't want nothing to do with that. Okay, so God doesn't want divorce. So that was good though. Okay. All right. <laughs> so here's the application. This is the application. Read the book of Hosea. Read the book of Hosea. Because I want you to see how far. Huh? H O S E A. Right. Hosea. I want you to read that book so you can see how far God goes into saying he doesn't want you to be divorced. Right. All right? Just read that book. It's, it's, it's a honestly, crazy book. <laughs> honestly, it's important for you all to learn about marriage and be mentored and around married couples so that you understand marriage is good. Marriage should not end up, you know, how in this example that we see here in the Bible. So if you know for a fact that you, you know, are not called to a single life, you want to be married, you want to have that wonderful relationship, read about it, learn about it, so that you can prepare yourselves in the future once you become married. Forward to Matthew 5, verse 33. Read with me. Again, you have heard it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven or for is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, and do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this, underline this, comes from the evil one. And so here, I just want to go back to verse 33. It says, do not break your oath, but fulfill it to the Lord. Look, as plainly as I can say it, your word is so important. Your word is very important. And the fact that you keep it, God says you, not, you must not break your oath. Why? Why is our word per, um, important? Because in this same way, how we take God's words as our own law, as a, our own instruction, he too puts emphasis on our word and the things that we say. And the Bible tells us, I can't remember what verse it is, but that the life, out of the life speaks life and death. Out of the tongue, I mean, speaks life and death. So if you are speaking out things, you have, the, you have power in your words. And so you should not be you know, loosely saying things. If you are not going to commit to something, do not say yes to it. And then we can drop down to verse 37. It says, all you need to simply say, I'm sorry, all you need to simply is say, is, all you need to say is simply yes or no. 
Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. In other translations, it says that your yes be a yes and your no be, be a no. Um, why? Because God wants us to be very decisive. He doesn't want us to move back and forth. In other words, he doesn't want us to work in confusion. When we're indecisive, and sometimes we are, I'm not getting down on people who can't make their mind up, but God doesn't want us to be in that state. God wants us to be able to clearly think on these different things, and he gives us the power to have a clear mind. And so if he's telling us to let your yes be a yes, why is that? So that we're not acting out in confusion. We should not be interacting with anyone else in confusion. If Pastor Chris asked me um, to go for a walk with him later on today, and I say, yes, and then afterwards I text him no, he's going to be confused. He's going to be like, well, well, why would you tell me yes then if you really didn't want to do that? So it's important for us, again, internally to have clarity. And when we do not have clarity, we have confusion. If you're taking notes, Confusion equals the enemy. The Bible says it right here in verse 37. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So if you are confused about anything and you are just kind of like, what is going on here? You need to seek clarity from God. Otherwise, this confusion is from the enemy. All right. So reteaching, uh, the Pharisees took this out of context again it's from exodus 27 exodus 20 verse 7 and basically don't say the lord's name in vain don't swear right that's not what for us to do so they took that and perverted it and when we're saying yes be a yes and no be a no god himself swears oaths to himself hebrews 6 13 luke 173 jesus spoke under oath, Matthew 26, all right? These things are serious. Because once you take an oath, you can't take it back. Right. So be very careful with these things, yeah. okay? So um, now let's continue. Jesus interprets the law. You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Underline that. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other um, to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, and take away your tunic, let them have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile with him, go two. Give him who acts of you, and from him who wants to borrow, do not turn away. So first, I want you guys to understand, is G I, I preach it this way, people preach it this way, is Jesus saying if someone punches you in the face right now to turn the other cheek, well, that would be great. That, that, that's technically what Jesus did, didn't he? Jesus took a bunch of punches. He took a bunch of stones. He yeah. took a bunch of whips. He took a bunch of stuff. And he literally turned the other cheek. Right. However, remember, the book of Matthew is speaking to the Jew. And it, uh, it, it automatically assumes that you know. Right. So in the custom, when you slap someone they meant it as you said something really disrespectful to them. You insulted them. You, you slandered their name. So when Jesus is saying, turn the other cheek if someone slaps you, he's saying if someone insults you, someone says something to you, says something about you, you're to endure that, right? Now, once again, we can also take it little because it's exactly what he did at the cross. But, however, in this context, right, that's what he meant. Right. And so Jesus, just to go deeper, is instead telling us that we are to show love and kindness to our enemies. And I know in our minds, we're like, how on earth can I show love and kindness to my enemy? Well, it goes back to our be attitudes. It goes back to the characteristics. It goes back to being the enhance and, um, enhancer, the preserver, right? And so when we think of these different characteristics of a Christ-like individual, it is easier. You have the tools to respond in this way to somebody who is hurting you. Jesus isn't telling you to allow these, you know, 
these wicked people to get away with their their terrible behavior he wants for us to have our actions towards those who are unkind to us to to emulate him Right. Our actions, when we respond to these individuals, our enemies should be Christ-like. So, once again, Jesus is not saying if someone comes to you with a baseball bat... Don't, don't go back it, with them. Let, 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 let them hit you with a baseball bat. Mm. That is not what he's saying. Once again, culturally in the time... Right. For example, in the time you were not supposed to use your left hand at all. The right hand was the right, the hand of power. The left hand was the hand you used the bathroom with. It was considered unclean. So people didn't use their left hands. So if somebody was slapping you at the, on the right cheek, it's assuming they're using their right hand. And if they're using your right hand to slap you on the right cheek, it's a backhanded, backhanded, backhanded slap. Yeah. You ever heard of a backhanded compliment? That's where it's come from. So Jesus is talking about enduring words because i don't want you to leave here allowing people to beat you okay that right. is not that is not what we're preaching right all right so self-defense is real very <laughs> important again we are not to respond with the spirit of hatred but in a way that shows christ-like character and values and so in these situations when we have an enemy I don't want you to look at this as a negative thing, although it feels negative, it's actually an opportunity. And so when you get your Christ lens on, you are able to see things differently. So when you are in contact with somebody who don't like you, or you consider them to be an enemy, you are actually in contact with someone who has been, who is not, in the same place as you, meaning they might not have Christ, meaning you have an opportunity to share Christ with someone either verbally or through your actions. So when you have an enemy and they are slapping you or they are talking bad, they're spreading rumors about you, the way that you respond determines if they will accept Christ. It possibly, it might could. There's a possibility that you can lead someone to Christ who is doing wrong to you. They're gonna say, why are you being so kind to me? I'm being so hurtful and so, so mean to you. And you can say, because I have Jesus, do you know him? So when you get in these situations, you can look at them as opportunities to spread the gospel. All right. So now let's continue. If anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak also. Exodus 22, 26, Deuteronomy 24, 13, under the law, the outer cloak was not to be taken, mm. right? So Jesus is saying, you, you have to look at the morality of it. If you can't lead someone to Christ, if you can't lead someone to God, you aren't to take these things so literal. You have to understand the proper teaching. Right. Um, so... So Spurgeon says, yet even in a country where justice can be had, we are not to resort to law for every personal wrong. We should rather endure to be put upon than be forever crying out. I'll bring in action. Then also when it says, whoever compels you to go one mile goes with him too. What does this mean? So under the time Israel was under Roman law and by law, if a Roman soldier came and say, hey you, I'm tired, carry my stuff for a mile. You had to, and the Jewish people hated it. Could you imagine you're in school right now and somebody comes to you or you're at work or you're walking and someone says, hey you, I'm tired, pick up my stuff and walk for a mile. You know how long a mile is? When's the last time any of you have walked a mile? Let's just be honest, right? When's the last time you've walked a mile? Like a real mile. <laughs> like, like a full mile. <laughs> I remember I remember the shows back in the day, the adults would be like, back in my day, I used to walk 15 miles in the in snow. The snow. <laughs> my dad would always right? say that. So, <laughs> so Jesus is saying to the extent of how we should treat people as much as you hate this, 
as much as you don't want to do this, I'm telling you to double it. Right. So. Definitely. And and honestly, that go, that's imagery there as well. Because remember how last week we talked about the level that the Pharisees were at and how that already was like a high standard? Now Jesus is telling us that we have to go beyond their standards, right? So we have here two levels. And so I just thought that was interesting that there's some imagery there. Love for enemies. Um, we're going to move forward to Matthew 5, 43. It says this, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor, underline that, and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, underline that, and pray for those who persecute you, underline that as well. That you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. And so I just want to touch on, um, what verse is that? Um, verse 45, the second sentence, it says, he causes this, his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, I don't, I don't want you to go out there thinking that every single one of your enemies is, is Satan's child. Like, I don't, I don't want you thinking that, okay? Does Satan have children? Yes, he does. Um, but in the same token... And we can be one of the children when we lie. Ooh. So he's the father of life. So hey, remember that. All right. <laughs> Boom. Um, what was I about to say, babe? Don't think your enemy is Satan's child. There you go. Do not think that your enemy is Satan's child, okay? Um, because in fact, they might also to be God's child, right? Mm -hmm. They might just be acting in their flesh. They might not have the same level of control as you do or maybe they're weaker in certain areas and you're seeing that weakness and that causes strife between you and that individual, don't be so quick to judge someone based on how they're making you feel, which is probably negatively, okay? Right. And so in the same way, he says, uh, he causes the sun to rise and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Mm -hmm. So meaning, if I have an issue with Chris and I'm upset with Pastor Chris, guess what? He's God's child too. So the way that I respond to him is how I'm responding to God. So the way that I'm treating Pastor Chris when I'm upset, God sees this. And what does the Bible tell us? That if you cause any of these to stumble, if, you, if, the, if the revenge is God's. Mm -hmm. So if I am doing something wrong to, God, to God's child who is Pastor Chris, I have to answer to God. Don't be rubbing on my shoulder up here, girl. Come on now. Sorry. You know? I have to answer to God. So please make sure that your Christ-like lens is not just looking at people, you know, in a, just overly spiritual, but that they are God's children. You, you know, your brother that's sitting next to you is also God's child. Your right. sister that's sitting next to you is also God's child. So just look at it in that way. You can love my soul when we get home. Though. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So here we go. Steps. It's levels to this. Now we have the most egregious, the most disrespectful, the most dangerous thing. You have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Remember, you have heard it was said, right? These people weren't reading your, their Bibles because if you look at it, Leviticus 19.18, the commandment was love your neighbor. You notice something mi missing? The Bible never says, hate your enemy. It's, it's never said. Okay. It is never said. The Mosaic law does not say, hate your enemy. Right. It is something that the Pharisees added. Right. So Jesus is reminding people, but I say to you, love your enemies. You know why? Because who's your neighbor? Ooh. There you go. Who's your Who is your neighbor? Right. Your enemy is your neighbor. Also. So, 
Once again, why is it important for you to read your Bible? You don't want someone to add something that is not there and now you are, listen, it's happened to me my entire Christian life. I have heard pastors that I love, that I, that I respect, preach things, and then I start quoting them, and then somebody tells me, you know that's not in the Bible, right? I'm like, what do you mean that's not in the Bible? Then I go, and I'm looking for it, and I'm like, oh my God, it is not in the Bible. <laughs> I've been telling people this wrong thing. It sounds great. Right. But it goes back to clarity. Mm -hmm. The Bible, the word of God brings clarity. So if you do not know the word of God, how are you going to see things clearly if you don't know it for yourself? That's like, I'm gonna give you, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm taking your hold again. That's like using someone else's glasses. Like, yes, glasses are good for people who can't see, but if your prescription is for you, how am I going to expect to have that same level of clarity? It doesn't make sense. The tool of the Bible brings clarity. So make sure that you are reading it for yourself and not just holding on to good quotes that other people are saying is coming from the Bible. You've got to fact check, fact check, and fact check until you blew in the face, until it's written on your heart, and you can spit it out from memory. All right, so, and how do you love sorry. your enemies? That was a little aggressive, I'm Not, sorry. I mean, it's, it's so, <laughs> it's like, it's yeah, I, don't, I don't mind. All right, so here we go. Love your enemy. You have to bless, do good, and pray for them. Bless your enemies, right? So when you can say a kind thing about people that you consider your enemies, say the kind thing. Right. When you can give, some, give them something, give it to them. When you can do good for them, do buy good. them, do good for them, buy them, pray for them. If you can do those things, regardless of how you're feeling, regardless of how they feel, make you feel, if you can do those things, you are acting in love. And you know what? Y'all ever hear the term, hurt people hurt people? Raise your hand. There's so much truth to it. Sometimes enemies are created from individuals who are hurting you because they themselves are hurt. And no one has ever taken the time to show them kindness, to give them the shirt off of their back, to go an extra mile with them. They've never had that. How do you think bullies are created? Because no one has actually showed them that affection. They have not seen it on a level that they can comprehend and actually regurgitate it out externally. So when we show them these different characteristics that are Christ-like, we are now saying, hey, I see you and I love you and I don't want you to hurt and I don't want you to act out in your hurt place anymore. Right. So that again is an opportunity for us to love on other people. That's why I'm telling you, don't just look at them as enemies or spawns of Satan. Instead, look at them as a child of God who is looking for clarity and who is also looking for love and healing from their afflictions. Right. And now let's get to, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? are not even the tax collectors doing that. In those times, people hated tax collectors. Tax collectors were viewed as traitors, okay? Because they were Jewish people who worked for the Roman government. Right. Uh, are you, if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not, I mean, as Christians. So if we're claiming this, that means we have to go further than just loving those who love us. Right. We have to go further and we have to be perfect. Now, here's the thing. If we just do, we understand, I understand, I am not perfect. You are not perfect. No one in here is perfect. However, if we could just live by what Jesus teaches us in Matthew 5, we would live a perfect life. Right. If we can not hate, not slander, not speak evil over other people. If we can not lust in our hearts or minds and not covet, want what other people have. If we can not make false oaths, false promises and always tell the truth. If we can defend God. If we can take up for God. If we can take everything to God. If we can love our neighbors and love our enemies. You would live a perfect life. Right. If you can legit, if we can do those things, we are living a perfect life. However, it's hard to do those things. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I, I do want to get into this, right? Um, so we're talking about the law, the law, 613 Mosaic laws that Moses came down. And remember, we spoke about this. God had one law. Don't eat the fruit. Then there was 10 commandments. Then there was 613. And then they became 11. Then they became six. Then they became three. Then they became two. Then they became one. And then Jesus is saying, love God with all your mind, heart, and soul. Love people as yourself and you fulfill the law. We teach, we preach, and this is, we, I think we make a mistake. We preach that the law is impossible to fulfill, which is true. However, we also preach we're under grace and make it seem like because we're under grace, we can do what we want and this yoke of grace is easy. Right. However, what we have to understand is Jesus is saying you have heard, but you have heard, but he's reteaching, but he's also establishing grace. The stipulations and the requirements of grace are harder than the stipulations that they were teaching, the false teachings of the law. Once again, no one in here has murdered, but we have been angry. No one in here, everyone in here, we, we, we may have told lies. We may have not kept the promise. Right. We may have harbored something. Right. However, under grace, we can't do these things. Grace is complete obedience to Christ. Right. When you have grace, you realize, remember, in the beginning of the chapter, we're bringing it full circle. I am spiritually poor. Blessed are those who are poor in the spirit. I have nothing without Christ. Because I have nothing without Christ, I give him everything. I'm a beggar. I'm homeless. I have zero. But because God switched places with me, I have everything. And because of that, I obey his commandments. Because of that, I obey grace. Now, listen. Listen to this. I want to be clear. Because Galatians 5, 13, 8. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Back to one. The entire law, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say walk by the spirit and you will not be, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Y'all, it's one or the other. The line is drawn in the sand. The law is for the flesh. The law is saying, I can do it by myself. The law is saying, I don't need God. If I walk perfect, remember, they were teaching it as an outward expression. Mm. So the law is saying, if I can do these things, I can be perfect so I don't need God. But grace is saying, I don't have to. Mm. Jesus did it for me. Mm. Jesus fulfilled it for me. Mm. And, And you see that in Romans 8. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. What does that mean? Once again, the Pharisees took the law, which was given by God, and corrupted it. Added to it. Made it surface level. And taught it wrong. So it was weakened. God did by sending his own son. In the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled, fully met in us. Mm-hmm. So Jesus put on this sinful flesh so he can fulfill the law, every, all 613 laws. However, he didn't allow his flesh to corrupt it. Right. He fulfilled it the way God intended it. Right. And because of that, He's the rightful sacrifice. He's the righteous, rightful redeemer. And when he died, he ushered in an era of grace where we're, no, we do not live by 613 Mosaic laws. However, I'm not telling you not to observe them. Because why wouldn't you not cheat? Why wouldn't you not hate? 
Why wouldn't you love? Right. I'm not going to tell you that the law is obsolete. It's not obsolete. However, if you make a mistake, right. guess what? You don't have to go to hell. Amen. And I make mistakes every day. Right. We make mistakes every day. Right. So Matthew 5, Matthew 5 yeah. is what it looks like to be a citizen of heaven. And I just want to leave us with this last scripture before we get into the next part of Bible study. Um, and I would love for you to take note of this, read it on your own. If you have maybe a common area you walk past every day, maybe print it out or write it out, put it on your mirror, put it on your door so you can see it often. It's Ephesians 1 through 8. Ephesians 1 through 8. I'm reading the NIV version. It says this, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint mm. of sexual immorality. Underline that. Not even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity mm. or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, nor moral, impure, or greedy person, such as a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Mm -hmm. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Mm. Therefore, do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live as children of light. So here's the whole point of Bible study. Verse 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words. How will you know they're empty words if you don't know the word of God for yourself? And God's word is not empty. God's word is full of power, full of love, full of truth, full of healing, full of covering, full of sovereignty, grace, and mercy. There's no way that that word is empty at all. So you have got to know for yourself as youth, as young people, what the word of God says and the weight of it. Right. So that when false prophets, a.k.a. deceivers, a.k.a. not really people of God, come to you and try to sell you lies, you know the difference mm -hmm. between God's word, which is the truth, and a lie, which is not God's word. And once you know God's word... Just understand, the law can be summed up into so many different verses. There's seek the Lord. Yeah. There's the righteous shall live by faith. Or there's love your enemy. Yes. Love your neighbor. Love. Right. And we sum up the entire law and you are a citizen of heaven. 